If you're building a bubble app to support a new business or an existing venture, then at some point you'll need to incorporate payments. There are many ways to process transactions. So in this video, we're going through the top three ways people monetize their bubble apps. If you're not quite sure which approach is right for you, then you'll want to follow along as we break these down, starting with subscriptions. Subscriptions are one of the most common types of pricing models for apps. This is where you collect a transaction from your users on a recurring basis, whether it's monthly, annually, uh, you know, the amount can be a different amount every billing cycle or a fixed amount every billing cycle. That's all dictated by you. And here are a few examples of the types of apps that work really well with the subscription model. The first is content based apps. So if your application is creating content that you want to offer exclusively to your users, then this is a, a great example, a great use case for a subscription system. We actually see this a lot with news websites these days. And here's another example, Blinkist. This application is summarizing books, podcasts, um, expert-led guides into easier to digest, shorter summaries for its users, and they work on a subscription system. So if we go over to their pricing page here, you can see that they have a monthly and an annual price that you can subscribe to. And once subscribed, you now have access to all of this exclusive content that's being created specifically within this environment here. The next type is any kind of application that supports curation businesses. So in our example here, Trade, uh, this is a business that will send coffee to its subscribers. And their entire business model is completely designed around the subscription system. So for example, if I click on choose your subscription, I can choose from one of their kind of predetermined um, packages where all I need to do is select my taste preference, my grind type, um, and then I can choose kind of my payment frequency that I want to do here. You know, at the end of the day, people usually want to replenish their coffee bags once they're done drinking all of their coffee. And so a subscription works really well so that the user doesn't have to go through and make all of these preference selections all over again. If we go back to this main page here, they also have an alternate way of creating the subscription by taking the user through a more custom uh, kind of personalization quiz where the application can learn more about them and then be able to make more personalized recommendations for those coffee deliveries. So this is a really good use case for using a subscription system for a product that users you know, expect to receive multiples of, right, on a recurring basis. The next use case for subscriptions is any kind of exclusive access to extra services or features, discounts, things like that. Um, our example here is Amazon Prime. So you don't have to have Prime in order to shop on Amazon. Uh, but if you do have a subscription with Prime, then you do get access to a few extra things. There's actually several benefits here. For example, faster shipping options, you get discounts on groceries. Um, if we scroll down here, you have uh, access to different entertainment options. Um, here are all of the different plan uh, choices that you can go with, right? So this is all very much on a subscription basis that gives you access to these additional, more exclusive services. The next use case is any kind of business utility application. And this is actually what we see a lot of bubble apps uh, being built for. So our example here is monday.com. They're primarily a project management platform for businesses and teams. Uh, they do have several different kind of branches of their product for different, uh, you know, legs of a business or working together. So they've got the task manager, the CRM manager, uh, manager here for uh, developers and also uh, ticketing and support. But at the end of the day, these are all tools that teams are logging into and they have to be subscribed in order to maintain access to their work, uh, you know, to be able to collaborate with other users, to upload files, to connect to other systems in some cases, um, be able to streamline everything, right? Everything is being saved in this space uh, and their subscription allows them to maintain access to all of the data that they're creating within these environments. If we switch over to their pricing page, you can see that they've got things uh, set up in many different tiers. Uh, the pricing also changes depending on the team size. So yes, access to this type of application is very much subscription powered um, and they're giving their users lots of different options so that it can really fit their needs as much as possible. 
Now, there are many ways to configure your subscription plan. First thing you want to think about is the billing frequency. Monthly and annual cycles are common, but you can also offer quarterly, weekly, you know, it really just depends on what's going to make the most sense for your business and your users. Then you want to think about how you're going to price those plans. So with flat rate pricing, everybody pays a fixed amount. They all get access to the same set of features um, and it's the same amount every billing cycle. Then you have tiered plans where you offer multiple plan options where the higher uh, in the tier you are, you get access to more things um, within the application. You also have usage-based pricing where based on the activity levels of the user within the plan, that will dictate their cost. And this could lead to variable pricing, let's say from month to month. Another pricing model that you'll find, especially with SaaS applications, is a module-based system where you know your, your users, typically these are companies as your customers, they're selecting modules that they want to add to sort of the base level plan to suit their needs. It's a little different from the tiered system. This is more about, I want to have this add-on onto my plan um, specifically and not another one, right? They're kind of custom configuring their package um, and you price them accordingly. Basically every module comes with its own price. And then you also have per user subscription systems where the number of users that are going to access the application under an account will dictate the cost. Um, this is also common with team-based applications. We saw this with monday.com where, you know, if your team is of a certain size, then you're going to pay uh, a certain amount. If your team is a little larger, then you're going to pay a little bit more. All right. Now the next way that people monetize their bubble apps is through fees. And we typically see this with marketplace apps where a user will pay another user for a product or a service and the application will take a fee out of that transaction. I'm going to use Airbnb as my marketplace example so that we can see how fees are applied to the final reservation. I'm currently acting as a guest looking to reserve this space here, right? So I'm one type of user looking to pay another type of user on this platform and a fee will be calculated and extracted. Um, to be sent to the platform, to Airbnb itself. That way, you know, operations and employees, you know, those expenses can be covered to run this marketplace service. So in my example reservation here, I've got a number of nights selected, five nights, two guests. I can see my base price here. This is dictated by the host, uh, multiplied by my number of nights. We have a starting point. Then the host has enabled a cleaning fee. This is going to go back to them to cover the cost of cleaning. And then here is a calculated platform fee, right? This is the Airbnb service fee. So as a guest, I'm paying this amount that's going to the platform, whereas the rest is going to go to the host so that the host can make some money as well. Um, going into this kind of breakdown here of the service fees, Airbnb is quite comprehensive. So they have, you know, more granular, um, uh, approach here to doing fees. And if you're building a marketplace, you know, you certainly don't have to get to this level of detail, especially when you're first getting started. But you know, this is a good example of, you know, you can really approach uh, creating revenue a lot of different ways, depending on the type of app that you're building, even within the marketplace category. So the most common uh, structure for Airbnb service fee is a split fee. So this way the fees actually split between the host and the guest. The next type of approach is the host only fee. This is not as common, but this basically means that the host is paying a larger percentage. The guest isn't paying anything. Um, so they have different rules for when those different approaches will apply. Okay, um, and Airbnb, again, it, they're more comprehensive. They have a few other fees that can apply. Um, so we saw the cleaning fee, this is enabled by the host. Um, we have an extra guest fee, again, enabled by the host if they want. Um, a pet fee, so if the space allows pets, the host may decide to add on an extra charge uh, just to cover you know, additional costs, perhaps around cleaning, extra cleaning, things like that. And then you have your security deposits that the host can enable and then taxes. Notice that the uh, total amount here is the calculated total before any taxes. So the users of this application, you know, they're able to join the app for free, uh, but they are paying the platform uh, either through, you know, the reservation as a guest or by having certain amount subtracted from the final payout uh, from the perspective of the host. So there are a few things to think about if you're looking to implement fees within your marketplace app. The first is 
is this going to be a percentage of the transaction total uh, or is it just going to be a flat fee same fixed amount every single transaction that is up to you so think about what's going to make the most sense for your business model and for your users the next thing you want to think about is who is responsible for the fees again especially in a marketplace environment is this going to be coming from the buyer the seller or maybe split between both as we saw with airbnb hey real quick if you're enjoying this take a look at our free extended workshop over at coachingnocodeapps.com workshop where we'll guide you through our four phased approach to go from idea to app if you're looking for a complete start to finish guide you're going to love this workshop I have the link on the screen and in the description below. All right, now the third way that people monetize their bubble apps is through in-app purchases. These are one-time payments that users are making in order to get access to extra features, services, add-ons. Uh, this is actually really common with freemium models. Let's take a look at a few different examples. Our first example is DocSpring. This is a PDF generating service. They have a really great API that's very compatible with Bubble. If you're in the market for a PDF generator, I do recommend this one, very comprehensive. But I wanna take a look at their pricing system, right, for their service. So we're gonna to go to their pricing page here. Now you can see that their primary structure is a subscription um, and in a tiered system as well, right? They've got three different options here. So let's look at this starter option. $49 a month gives you access to generating 50 PDFs every single month. So that number would reset for you. However, if you wanted to go over that uh, allocated 50 PDFs and stay on this starter plan, you can pay an additional 25 cents per PDF. This is a one-time payment for every document as needed. So this is an example of an in-app purchase, right? Once you have an account with the system, you can choose to make this additional payment if you want. Notice that when you go up to the, the next tier, this professional, um, the numbers change a little bit. So you are already getting more PDFs included, a thousand PDFs here. If you wanna go over, uh, they actually drop the rate per PDF, so 10 cents for every additional. Uh, this is because you're already paying more for your subscription. And then uh, the numbers change even more when you're on their business plan. Over 5,000 PDFs uh, you know, that come included, you pay only five cents for every additional, okay? So this is an example of an in-app purchase. Now the next example is with freemium apps. So I've got two examples for that model actually, MyFitnessPal and Duolingo. So MyFitnessPal is the first one here. This is a fitness tracker, nutrition tracker, um, very popular uh, with folks who are looking to build healthier habits. And we can see that on their primary landing page, they're marketing the free version of this product. That's the most popular version, right? That's their base product. I actually have to scroll down to the very bottom of the page. Let's see if we can find it here. Uh, there is a premium version that we can access. I think it might actually be in their footer. There it is. I'm going to click on this here and I'm taken to a completely separate landing page uh, where I can read more about premium features that I can access with a subscription. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down further here. We can see the differences in what we get access to and then we can see the different options. So getting access to the premium version, right, which is not the flagship product is through this uh, you know, this, this add on payment that I'm going to make through a subscription if I want, but I don't have to subscribe in order to access that base product, right? So this is, this is our freemium model. Duolingo is another application that uh, works on a freemium system. Their flagship service is a free language learning application. Um, you know, that's what they're marketing here. And then if we go down to the middle of their landing page, we can see uh, a mention of their premium uh, offering, which is Super Duolingo. And I actually have to go to the very bottom of their footer to access the landing page for the Super Duolingo. And this is similar to my fitness pal in that you're also doing a subscription to basically unlock additional uh, features to remove ads. That's a common reason for doing in-app purchases or upgrading to the premium version of uh, an otherwise free product is to remove ads. Otherwise, you know, the platform is bringing in revenue from the ads, you know, for any users that are on their free plans. 
Uh, so we can see here some other benefits. They, you know, unlock the number of mistakes they can make within the lessons, whereas the free version will sort of limit you and then you have to kind of wait a day, for example, things like that. So the freemium model is very popular for in-app purchases. Now, our final example is Thumbtack. Now, this is a marketplace for service professionals to get connected with um, customers so that they can hire them for different jobs. And the way that Thumbtack's pricing works is that it's free for a professional to sign up and list themselves. However, they need to pay for leads um, and pay for bookings. And under the kind of uh, documentation here for Thumbtack, we can actually see that the uh, the professional can set a, a budget, right? A limit to how much they're willing to spend in order to get access to those leads. So notice that in their marketing here, this is for the professional specifically, there are no subscription fees. So this is very much based off of one-time payments um, that uh, the pro is going to make in order to complete these connections. It's a different type of model for a marketplace so that it makes it easy to build that user base of professionals, uh, right? So that customers have even more options, um, but the platform can also bring in some revenue as well to support their own operations. Now I do want to touch on the actual tools you need in order to process payments in your application, regardless of which model you want to use. The first is you need to decide on a payment gateway to actually process your transactions. Bubble is not a platform that can actually process transactions, right? So Stripe is a very popular one. PayPal is also another one. There are many other services out there, as long as they offer an API that you can integrate into your Bubble app, that's the most important thing. But all of the sense information around credit cards, uh, addresses, things like that, uh, you want your payment gateway to handle that. Now, in your Bubble application, you can use a plugin to integrate with that payment gateway. Uh, there are many plugins for the most popular gateways like Stripe and PayPal, but you also have access to the API connector. It's technically a plugin with Bubble, but this is really an API connection tool that you can use to create custom integrations with any API. So that's why I say, as long as your payment gateway that you want to go with to process your transactions offers an API, you should be able to integrate with it. At the end of the day, you need to choose the model that's going to best fit your application, your content, your features, and your users. All right, I hope this was helpful. And if it was, the content you're about to see on the screen next is going to help you take things even further.